Um, so 1 Kings is where we're at. Today, we celebrate the day Jesus announced to the world that he was a peaceful king who had conquered a foe. The event is called the Triumphal Entry, and the Sunday that commemorates it is called Palm Sunday. Look at you guys. Jesus is 33 years old. He knows he's in his final days, so he sets his face towards the big city and enters Jerusalem the same way a king would after conquering a foe. So what was the conquered foe Jesus was declaring victory over? He had not conquered Rome, the oppressive Rome. He had not gotten rid of or overthrown the evil King Herod. He had not really done much damage or changed much of the, the arrogant um, structure that the Pharisees and Sadducees had set up in the religious system and caste system of that day. So what did he conquer? What was he declaring as he rode into Jerusalem and basically sent people out ahead of him to announce the, the, that he was coming and, and to have this parade of disciples cheering, Hosanna, the Savior has come, he saved us. He's the king, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of David. What had he conquered that made him want to go public with being a king for the first time in his life? Well, I think the answer is he had conquered sin. Now, what's interesting here is that on the cross, we know Jesus conquered a lot. He paid the price for our sin. Um, the resurrection was, was that he, he, proof that he had conquered death. Once and forever, he had become the sacrifice that could take away the sins of the world. But Jesus conquered sin every moment of every day as temptation would come and he would not succumb. He is the only one who has been tempted like humanity is tempted, yet without sin. There was one other who came on the scene who was not sinful but was tempted, and that was Adam. And yet Adam succumbed and brought great devastation to the world that we're still living under today. But Jesus Christ, as he was going around healing people and performing miracles, he was demonstrating to everyone that he had authority to undo all the damage that sin had done. And then as he was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, he was glorified, and he was there with Moses and Elijah before the presence of God. Basically, that was symbolizing that Jesus had passed the test. He had at that point been tempted in every way that you and I have, are ever tempted, yet without sin. And in that moment, he had a decision to make. He had fulfilled the law of God. He had done what God had asked them to do. And was that enough? Or would he go down that Mount of Transfiguration and go to the cross? And the only reason that he would go down that Mount of Transfiguration to the cross was because he had not yet paid the price for you and I. He had fulfilled the law. He had, he had become the sinless king. But we were still guilty of our sin. And because of his great love for us, he walked down that man of transfiguration and he resolutely set his face towards Jerusalem. And now he comes into Jerusalem announcing as a king, as a peaceful king, because he rode a donkey, not a horse. As a peaceful king, he was coming to declare that he had conquered sin and was now the king above all kings, the sinless king who was able to provide a sinless sacrifice for the sin debt of humanity. It's a day worth celebrating, this triumphal entry. That's why it's called triumphal entry, because he triumphed over the thing that you and I could never and have never been able to triumph over, the foe of sin. And so we kind of spend the moment thinking about that because in our series on First Kings, we've been looking at king after king after king after king after king who, when tempted with sin, succumbed. And not only succumbed, but subtly and, and, and kind of in small ways made these little compromises that in, ultimately led Israel further and further and further into idolatry and ultimately ruin. And so we look at 1 Kings and we see that in this time of history, God's people were becoming blind and numb to idolatry and sin. And we're doing this because we do not want to become God's people 
in our day and age who are becoming blind and numb to idolatry and sin. So we're taking the word of God and we're allowing it like a magnifying glass to look into our lives. No matter how pretty or how ugly we come out. But we do not want to fall prey to the same things they fell prey to. And it was just a few hundred years between King Saul and King David and King Solomon till Israel was completely destroyed. And I do think in our society as Americans, and I don't say this lightly and I don't say this judgingly, but I do think our society is progressing away from the things of God and more into the things of this world or the things that are incongruent with the lines of God that he has drawn for our own freedom and flourishing. And yet, though that is, is something I see taking place and I'm praying for a great awakening because we've had awakenings in America before that swept across sea to shining sea that turned hearts back to God and his ways. And it's been beautiful and wonderful. I'm praying for some more of that. Anybody with me? Yeah? I'm not like, oh, all hope is lost. America, down with America. We hate. No, not, not at all. I'm just trying to say, I think I'm seeing these things, so I'm praying. That'll be able to see the opposite happen. And I think we all should be doing that. We should have hope and we should pray because God can do it. God can do it. But at the same time, I'm also trying to give warning to my own soul and to my own household and to us as a church that these things are creeping their way into the household of faith. I'm having conversations with people who are brothers and sisters in Christ and people who've walked with us for a while who, who are now saying that they don't think sin is sin according to what the Bible teaches. And it's just creating these, these moments where there's this kind of pressure. It's starting to come in and it's causing some divisions. And so it's so important for us to look at God's word again and say, okay, Lord, you get to speak. We're putting you on the throne to decide what is good and right and wrong. And we're not gonna let our culture be on the throne. We're not gonna let our own desires be on the throne. We're not gonna let um, our sinful you know, flesh be on the throne. We're gonna watch out for selfishness and we're gonna watch out for the idols of comfort and security and convenience. We're gonna make sure you are the one on the throne deciding what is right and what is not right. And it's been challenging, it's been tricky and it's been unpopular. <laughs> but that's okay. It's okay. So we're looking at 1 Kings because they were going through a lot of the similar things. Um, we have Jeremiah who wrote this book according to tradition, and he's writing this to help people wake up from their stupor, wake up to the reality of the decline that's taking place all around them. And we, we really did make sure that even though he's kind of a weeping prophet and he's moaning and groaning, he is not a bullfrog. Jeremiah is not a bullfrog. He was a weeping prophet. We kind of had to clear that up earlier on in the, this sermon series. Um, but he's basically speaking about how the people of God slowly but surely continued to um, kind of give in to these things. And he's talking to, talk to us about a lot of different things. And just to sum up, I'm going to read um, just kind of some real quick, like, um, inter like basically summarizations from Jeremiah about these kings and some of what they did. Um, under Rehoboam, in 1 Kings 14, Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. By the, by the sins they committed, they stirred up God's jealous anger more than those who were before them had done. They also set up for themselves high places, sacred stones and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. The people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations of the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. So when Israel was a consecrated people set apart as God's people, they continued to want to more and more be like the nations around them. And it was more and more bringing in their idolatry, more and more bringing in their thoughts, more and more bringing all these things in till eventually they, they were a people that God w was angry at. His jealous anger was enraged. It's true that God is slow into anger, but God also is angry at sin and those who are walking in it. That's the most loving thing he can do at that point is to be angry against those who are leading people into idolatry and sinfulness and ruin. And God was angry at them. They had right there, this is talking about God's people. There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. 
Basically what this was is that Solomon had set up all these different worship to all these other gods and, and some of those gods required you to have sex to worship them. And so you would go and it just so happened to be male prostitutes. So if you were male or female, you would go and have sex with these people to worship these gods. It was a way that you would honor them. And it wasn't just stupid, but it was, it was that you would get the reward. You would get the blessing of fertility of your land or your family by doing this. And this was going on in the, in, in the nation of God that God had blessed and led out of captivity and given them the land. Another king under Ahab, they did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He, was not only, he not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nevat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. So he was setting up um, Baal worship. And Baal worship kind of, at this point in Israel, it was like worship of Yahweh. They never really stopped worshiping Yahweh, but at this point in Israel's history, definitely Baal was the main god of the Israelites. And Yahweh was a side god. Which was very upsetting to the Lord. And under Ahaz, they, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel and even sacrificed his son in the fire, engaging in detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burned incense at the high places, on the hilltops, and over, under every spreading tree. Now, I don't know what a spreading tree is in this regard, but I'm sure you can look at commentaries and they talk about it for a long, long time, which is fun about commentaries and also so boring sometimes. Um, but anyways, but he's offering his own son as a sacrifice in the fire, which was a practice of the god Moloch, again, to get fertility and prosperity. And we look at these things and we think, these people are crazy for them to be so bizarre in their sexual immorality and to be so bizarre in what they're willing to sacrifice and kill, even of their own families, for these gods. And yet, I think if we're honest, in our society, we see some very similar type things. And that's the scary thing about sin, is the sin that we commit, we don't get to decide what the consequence is or who suffers the consequence. And as we see in the, in the um, story of Solomon, Solomon was very sexually immoral. And yet he didn't suffer the consequence. His son did. And all the people of Israel ultimately did. And when we choose to, the idolatry of greed or money, or we choose the idolatry of sex or power or position, so oftentimes it's our kids that get sacrificed at those altars. And in some ways, I bet everyone in this room or listening online could tell a story of something that they experienced because of the idolatry of their parents or maybe the, something their kids have experienced because of their idolatry and sin. And it's very heavy stuff. But these kings were people just like you and I. But then, just before we get too bummed out, we keep going. There's some, there's some other kings. Now, I re, I'm gonna read about, I read three kings that did not do what was right in the Lord, right in the eyes of the Lord, and then I'm gonna read three kings that did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Don't for a second think that it was a kind of an even spread. <laughs> Basically, you got about three, maybe five. If you really wanna stretch, you got about eight out of 50 kings did any good at all. The rest, horrible, horrible. But here's some good news. Asa, under Asa, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as his father David had done. He expelled the male shrine prostitutes from the land and got rid of all the idols his ancestors had made. He even deposed his grandmother. 
Yeah, you can laugh at that. I think it's funny too. Marka, from her position as queen mother, because she had made a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah, Esau cut it down and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Although he did not remove the high places, there's Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, Esau's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. So here's good news. And, and it is funny to read in the Bible about, you know, a guy getting rid of his grandmother in, in this way. Um, but it's not funny um, what many of us are going through in our own families as we navigate um, the differences and the, the, the challenges that, that are presented there when loved ones make decisions that are not in line with the scriptures or the lines that God has given us. And we're trying to uphold those lines um, and at the same time um, love them. And it's, this is where tricky. This is where the love of God is so much deeper than the love that we have and Hallmark Channel teaches us about. Because love is patient, love is kind, but it rejoices in the truth at the same time. It is deep and it is rich and it is challenging for people like us. And sometimes we have to draw those lines. Jesus taught us that there are times in our following of him where we're gonna have to hate our brother and hate our sister. And he's not actually saying that we should hate them. He's saying that they're gonna perceive what you're doing as hate when really all you're doing is trying to follow them and love them. And those become very difficult times. Good times to pray. And good times to sing about a God who chases down people on their prodigal roads. A good time to think about a God who wants to, um, to, to come into our lives and restore our broken lives. A good time to sing about a God who there's no mountain he won't climb, right? There's no wall he won't break down. It's good to think about God in those times and to pray. The next king under Hezekiah, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made for up to that time. The Israelites had been burning incense to it. Here's a story of even something that was, that was a, a, a done in, in memory of God and what God had done. They had made an idol out of that and were worshiping that instead of the Creator. And then we get on to Josiah, and we're going to spend a little more time talking about Josiah. I've chopped up the, the um, kind of the, the full portion of, of story about Josiah. You can read it later if you want, but I've just kind of given us some little highlights in there because I've been watching a lot of March Madness highlights, and it's just all highlights. I love highlights. It's like, don't have to watch free throws, all boring stuff. Just give me the highlights, and Baylor's still in it, so my bracket's still alive. It's like, yeah. Um, Josiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. When the king Josiah heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes and he gave orders to Hokiah the priest and some other guys and said, go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah about what was written in the book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger against us because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with what was written there concerning us. It's a fascinating moment in the history of Israel. Because we're in second kings now when we get to Josiah. So we've gone through a lot of kings. So we're towards the end of, of the time of the kings before they actually go into exile in Babylon and Judah and they get taken over by the Assyrians in, in Israel up north. And here Josiah is becomes king and wants to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And so he starts to try and figure out what that is. And, and he knows that these high places are evil. So he starts working on those things. But one of the things he wants to do is get the temple of, of Yahweh back, back in action. And, and, and he starts cleaning it out and doing all these things. And in the process of doing that, a guy finds a scroll. And he doesn't know what the scroll is. So then he takes it to some different people. They finally get to a priest and they're like, what is this thing? And the priest is like, that's the Torah. That's the law of God. That's the thing that God gave Moses as they were on that Mount Sinai and in Egypt. That's the thing that has basically caused us, to, that teaches us God's ways. 
And so he brought it to the king and he's like, king, I'm, I wanna show you something that we found. It had been gone, they didn't even know where it was. It had been buried. It had been forgotten, it had been totally rendered unimportant for long enough to where now they didn't even know where it was. And he starts to read it to King Josiah. And Josiah, the reason I'm having trouble is I've been praying for Josiah's to show up in our day. But Josiah gets hit in the face with this stuff. He gets his heart chopped up by the word of God and he repents. He falls on his knees, he tears his clothes and said, God, I'm sorry, but thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for letting it come to the surface. Thank you so much for helping us awake to the reality of what's going on. And he tells his guys, go and figure out every single thing in this book that we're doing wrong and let's make it right. It was such a beautiful, beautiful response. And so, they find some things that they're doing wrong. And the king ordered Hilkiah, the priest next in rank, to remove from the temple of the Lord all the articles made for Baal and Asherah and the starry hosts. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron Valley and took the ashes to Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priests appointed by the kings of Judah to burn incense of high places um, of all the towns of Judah and those around Jerusalem. He took the Asherah pole from the temple of the Lord. We're talking about this stuff in the temple of the Lord. And he took it to the Kidron Valley outside Jerusalem and he burned it there. He ground it to powder and scattered the dust over the graves of the common people. Again, common people, it's like, what? Where did that come from? It's just, he's fired up though. He also tore down the quarters of the male shrine prostitutes that were in the temple of the Lord. Did you hear what I just said? In the temple of the Lord that Solomon built for Yahweh. There was a portion that was used to house the male shrine prostitutes. Josiah kicked some booty that day. And that was also the quarter where the women did the weaving for Asherah. I don't know what that's about. He pulled down the altars the kings of Judah had erected on the roof near the upper room of Ahaz and all the altars Manasseh had built in the two courts of the temple of the Lord. He removed them from there, smashed them into pieces and threw the rubble in the Kidron Valley. The king also desecrated the high places that were east of Jerusalem on the south of the hill of corruption. Why is there a hill of corruption? The one Solomon, king of Israel, built for Asherah, the vile goddess of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, the vile god of Moab, and for Moloch, the detestable god of the people of Ammon. Josiah smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles and covered the sites with human bones. It's serious. It's very serious. Furthermore, Josiah got rid of the Medians and Spiritists, the household gods the idols of all the other detestable things seen in Judah and Jerusalem. This he did to fulfill the requirements of the law written in the book that Hilkiah the priest had discovered in the temple of the Lord. Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength in accordance with the law of Moses. Hallelujah. And just in case you think he was a big jerk and didn't know how to have fun, the king gave this order to all the people, celebrate the Passover. Make sure you throw a party to the Lord your God, as is written in this book of the covenant, neither in the days of the judges who led Israel, nor in the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah had any such Passover been observed. He threw a huge party across the whole land to celebrate what God had done the Passover and there was great rejoicing in God's heart his anger was stayed as he looked down and he saw Josiah whose heart was fully his but Josiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and he did all of these other things. He was proactive in that. He knew that as the word of God came to him, he was supposed to respond by doing that boundary maintenance we talked about early on. For not only his own soul, but his household and the institutions that he was a part of, just so happens he was the king. <laughs> 
of the whole nation. But the zeal of the Lord consumed him. He was hungry and thirsty for righteousness. And as he walked that out, he was filled. He chose to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness above everything else. And this is what it looked like for him in his time. And it pleased the Lord. It was a beautiful thing in his eyes. So what does it look like for us to do this in our day with our own souls and households and institutions? I don't know. (laughs) That's why you got the Spirit of God living inside you. But what I love about this is when the line of God came and, and basically dissected Josiah and his people, when the line of God came and cut his heart in half, helping him to realize that he was outside the lines of God. He was outside where God needed to be. They were so far off. He did not respond thinking that God doesn't love him or want him. He actually, by the grace of God, was able to respond to say, actually, God has helped me see the lines because he loves me that much and doesn't want me to head off into decay and depravity and destruction. He actually has drawn these lines for me to help me know, like a roadmap, how to get back in. And also, he's drawn these lines to help me become aware of how badly I need him. And each and every every time we've been in one of these messages, or each and every time you hear the word of God taught, or you read it for yourselves, and one of those lines that God has written is coming to you and making you feel like you are not right, you are incongruent, there is something in your life that is outside the boundaries of God. The devil wants to come in that moment and say, see, you don't belong. See, they don't love you or want you. See, God doesn't love you or want you. And that is the devil talking, and he is very faithful to do that. But at that same time, when that line hits you, when your heart is pricked, as the Bible describes it, like Hezekiah, or Josiah was, what God wants you to hear is that he loves you. And he wants to see you get into the fullness of what he has for you. And that he can rescue you. And he can heal you. And he can make you whole. And that's the message that Jesus came to bring. That's the message that Jesus was declaring as he rode that donkey into Jerusalem all those years later. That's the message that he cried on the cross as he gave up his last breath and said, it is finished. And as his blood flowed, basically what he was saying to you and I is when you find yourself outside the lines that God has drawn, when you find yourself with your hearts pricked, when you find yourself in trouble, outside, alone, apart from God. You're supposed to look up at that cross and see his arms stretched wide, ready to receive you. You're supposed to see his blood and know that that blood was a sacrifice that can wash you clean. And no matter what heinous sin you have committed or you're in right now, his blood is way more powerful. Always has been and always will be. And then you're also supposed to see him as that resurrected Lord, offering freely his spirit to empower us to win our battles against sin, to find victory from time to time over the sin that's inside of us, that's, that's lying at the door waiting to devour us. That's what Jesus came to declare to each one of us. And I'm just praying, whether you're online or in this person, or in, in, in person, if, if these messages, if the word of God has come and it has hit you, or it has cut you, that you would realize that that is, that is what the, the word is supposed to do. Actually, the New Testament says that the, the, the law of God is a schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. It's basically like that angry, mean teacher that was always telling you when you were doing something wrong so that you would know that you need a rescuer, you need a savior, so that you would come to Christ and you would find out that he's been there all along, only one step away. And what's cool is the Lord has been raising up so Josiah's in our fellowship. 
We have a guy that I know I, he told me the story of him basically just hearing these words recently and saying, that's it. And he put away all of this sexually immoral paraphernalia that he'd been practicing and playing with. And he's distanced himself, not because of COVID, he's distanced himself from people that he knows were leading him in the wrong way. And what he told me was the result was he's never been able to hear from the Lord so often. That's why Jesus wants us to get in these lines, because he wants to talk to us. He wants to love us. And out there, we can't hear him. We had a guy just show up on the lawn out here about a month ago, and he just dumped a bunch of cocaine and other drugs on the lawn and said, I'm sick of it. And we were like, should we call the police? <laughs> and the guys, you know, who handled him said no. They said, let's go flush this down the toilet. And they actually got some other people to make sure nobody thought like they snuck away with it out the back door. And they, you know, they flushed it down the toilet. And then we connected that guy with Kurt and trying to help him figure out what Jesus is doing. Because he was walking around out there in the darkness and he just got so sick of it. And he looked over and he said, maybe they have some light. We got some people that have decided that they weren't going to worship at the altar of convenience and comfort and security. But instead, they, they have aging parents and they've decided to bring those aging parents back home with them to give them honor and dignity as they finish their days at great inconvenience to them, for sure. And another guy actually took, he and his wife, they just moved away from us and everything that they loved and all the goodness they were experiencing to go do the same thing to just make sure his parents were getting loved and cared for. And I'll tell you what, that's something that God is really pleased with. And I could go on and on. It might just seem little to you, but it's not little to the Lord. Actually, my wife went to a birthday party yesterday for a kid who's been quarantined his whole life because of autoimmune diseases. And uh, yeah, instead of birthdays, he asked if everybody could donate to the food pantry here. It's like 10 years old. He's a little Josiah. And so it falls to us. We have a great, great history. Ever since Jesus rode that donkey into Jerusalem, declaring his victory over sin, there has been a long light of parade, a great cloud of witnesses that have been following his lead and gaining victory over sin and doing away with high places and idolatry in their, in their lives and in their families and in the institutions they're a part of. Many different ways. What are we gonna do? What is the Lord asking you to do? I know someone in our fellowship that they've been together for a long time as boyfriend and girlfriend and they got kids and all of that and they're saying, we're ready to get married before the Lord. There's a lot of things that we can do to follow him. Some people built an underground railroad. Some people built a hiding place. Some missionaries have gone and it's cost them their life. But then their family went to the same people and saw them get saved. Lots of ways that we can serve the Lord. Let's pray. Wow, Lord, you just keep it coming, huh? Lord, I pray that you really would help us to, to not fall prey to the, our desires for sex, money, self, individualism, convenience, security, comfort, or even ideological popularity or significance. But instead, Lord, we would just have your word hidden in our hearts that we might not sin against you. That your word would be a light into our path. And we would walk in it, Lord. And I pray that us as a church, Lord, I pray for the whole church, but I, I really pray for us living streams right now in Phoenix in 2021. 
I pray that we would be the salt and light that you want us to be. Lord, where we've lost any saltiness, please forgive us and heal us. We know, Lord, you want us to stand against the decay in our society, but all at the same time bring healing. We know you want us to be a city set on a hill so that those who are walking in darkness and finally get sick of it can look and have some place to run. Please help us, Lord, to not be like the older brother that rejects people who come home, but instead to be just like you, Father, and receive them and robe them. We thank you, Jesus, that you found us that we were once lost and blind, but now we're found and we see.